Hello and welcome to the Ghost Town Chronicles. Today we will explore most incredible abandoned places on Earth. Number 1. Mir Mine, Saka Republic. The Mir Mine, also known as the Murni Mine, is an open pit diamond mine located in Murni, Saka Republic, in eastern Russia. It is one of the largest excavated holes in the world, with a depth of over 525 meters, 1,722 feet, and a diameter of 1,200 meters, 3,900 feet. Open pit mining began in 1957 and was later converted to underground mining in 2009. The diamond deposits at Mir Mine were discovered in 1955 by Soviet geologists during an expedition. The presence of kimberlite, a volcanic rock associated with diamonds, led to the successful identification of diamond-bearing deposits. The discovery was a significant achievement, and one of the geologists, Yuri Kabardin, was awarded the prestigious Lenin Prize for his contribution. Development of the mine posed challenges due to the extreme climate. The region experienced seven months of freezing temperatures, making mining difficult. The permafrost had to be thawed using jet engines or dynamite during winter. Buildings were constructed on piles to prevent sinking into the ground, and machinery had to be covered to prevent freezing. During its peak production in the 1960s, the mine yielded around 10 million carats of diamonds per year, with a substantial portion of gem-quality stones. However, over time, the diamond content decreased, and production slowed down as the mine reached greater depths. The largest diamond found at Mir Mine weighed 342.5 carats, and was discovered in 1980. In 2001, the surface operation of the mine ceased, and it was subsequently operated underground. The mine was managed by the Saka Diamond Company, and later by Arosa, Russia's largest diamond producer. A network of tunnels was constructed for underground diamond recovery and the mine was expected to have a mine life of 27 years based on exploration drilling. The Mir mine underwent a temporary closure in 2004 but was recommissioned in 2009. It is projected to remain operational for approximately 50 more years. In 2017, the underground mine experienced a flood incident that trapped a significant number of miners, but the majority were successfully rescued. Number 2. Ross Island, India. Ross Island, also known as Nataji Subhash Chandra Bose Island, is an island in the Andaman Islands, belonging to the South Andaman Administrative District in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. It is located three kilometers east of central Port Blair and is known for its historic ruins that attract tourists. The island was originally named after Marine Surveyor Daniel Ross, but in December 2018, it was renamed as Nataji Subhas Chandra Bose Island as a tribute to India's freedom fighter. Ross Island played a significant role in the history of the Andaman Islands. In the late 18th century, a settlement was established at Port Blair, then known as Port Cornwallis. However, due to a high mortality rate, the settlement was later shifted to the Northern Harbor. During this time, a hospital and sanatorium were established on Ross Island by Archibald Blair. In 1858, the British decided to establish a penal settlement in the Andaman Islands, and Ross Island became the administrative headquarters for the islands until 1945-46. The island served as a prison for revolutionaries and housed various facilities such as a bazaar, bakery, church, hospital, and more. It was during this period that Nataji Subhas Chandra Bose visited the island in 1943. Ross Island also witnessed the Japanese occupation during World War II. The government house became the residence of a Japanese admiral, and Subhas Chandra Bose hoisted the national tricolor there. After the Allies reoccupied the island in 1945, it was eventually abandoned. In 1979, the island was handed over to the Indian Navy, and a small naval post, INS Jerawa, was established. In 2018, the island was officially renamed Nataji Subhas Chandra Bose Island by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Geographically, the island is part of the Port Blair Islands and is located at the entrance of Port Blair. It is characterized by thick forests, 
and is home to wildlife such as spotted deer and peacocks. The island is surrounded by palm and coconut trees. Ross Island does not have any civilian settlements, as it is under the control of the naval authorities. It remains a significant historical site and a popular tourist destination due to its well-preserved ruins and the legacy of its past. Number 3. Kalmanskop, Namibia Kalmanskop is a ghost town located in the Namib Desert in southern Namibia, around 10 kilometers from the port town of Literitz. It was named after a transport driver named Johnny Coleman, who left his ox wagon behind during a sandstorm near the settlement. Once a prosperous mining village, it is now a tourist destination managed by the joint firm Namibia de Beers. The history of Kalmanskop dates back to 1908 when a worker named Zacharias Luala discovered a diamond in the area and brought it to the attention of his supervisor, August Stotch, a German railway inspector. Recognizing the diamond-rich potential, German miners settled in the region and the German Empire declared a large area as a diamond mining zone known as the Spergebiet. With the initial wealth generated by the diamond miners, the residents of Kalmanskop constructed the village in the architectural style of a German town. It boasted various amenities and institutions such as a hospital, ballroom, power station, school, theater, sport hall, casino, ice factory, and even the first X-ray station in the Southern Hemisphere. The town had a railway connection to literates. However, during World War I, the town began to decline as the diamond deposits started to deplete. The situation worsened in the 1920s when the richest diamond-bearing deposits were discovered 270 kilometers south of Kalmanskop near the Orange River. This new find made it easier to gather diamonds from the beach terraces rather than the more challenging mining process. Many residents of the town left their homes and belongings behind and joined the rush to the south. Eventually, in 1956, the town was completely abandoned. Today, Kalmanskop is a captivating site for photographers due to the desert sands engulfing the once thriving town. The arid climate has preserved the traditional Edwardian architecture, adding to its appeal. However, due to its location within a restricted area known as the Spergebiet, visitors need a permit to enter the town. Number 4. Hashima Island. A dark silhouette sits off the coast of Nagasaki, Japan, unmoving, haunting, and isolated. One might mistake it for an ancient war relic if not for the uncanny resemblance to an eerily deserted cityscape. Welcome to Hashima Island, or as it is often called, Gunkanjima, Battleship Island. Hashima wasn't always this ghostly island with crumbling concrete structures. It was once the epitome of Japan's rapid industrialization, a powerhouse of coal mining that fueled the nation's ambitions. Located just over nine miles from Nagasaki, the island was discovered to be sitting on a wealthy coal reserve in the late 1800s. Mitsubishi, the famous industrial conglomerate, promptly acquired the island in 1890. Their aim? to mine the coal to power their shipbuilding industry. Within a few decades, Hashima Island transformed from an uninhabited rock to a thriving microcosm of human civilization. An impressive feat of engineering, Mitsubishi built multi-story concrete apartments, some of which were among Japan's first large-scale reinforced concrete buildings. Imagine living on an island nine times more densely populated than modern-day Tokyo. That was Hashima. Residents wanted for little despite their isolation. The island featured schools, restaurants, and even entertainment outlets like a movie theater and a pachinko parlor. But life was not all roses. Water had to be ferried in from the mainland, and the absence of soil meant not a single tree broke the monotony of the concrete. The island had a community garden, albeit one built on imported soil and supported by a seawall. Everything on Hashima was a testament to human ingenuity and the desire to carve out a living in the most inhospitable conditions. Hashima's glistening success story has a shadowy chapter. During World War II, the island's coal mines were operated by forced laborers from Korea and China. Working under extreme conditions, these laborers are a part of Hashima's history that was conveniently forgotten for many years. 
These stories only began to resurface when the island was considered for UNESCO World Heritage status in 2015, a bid that sparked significant controversy and nearly strained diplomatic relations between Japan and South Korea. The same industrialization that birthed Hashima also led to its downfall. By the 1960s, Japan had begun to transition from coal to petroleum. The mines started to dry up, and it became increasingly clear that Hashima's heyday was behind it. In 1974, Mitsubishi officially closed the mine, and residents began leaving en masse. Within a span of a few months, an island that had once held over 5,000 people was deserted. Here's a lesser-known tidbit. Hashima served as an inspiration for the villain's lair in the James Bond movie Skyfall. While the scenes were not shot on the island itself due to accessibility and safety concerns, detailed digital replicas were created. Also, despite its desolate appearance, Hashima is not completely devoid of life. In the absence of humans, vegetation has found a way to reclaim the island, offering a poetic juxtaposition of nature against the brutalist architecture. Another lesser-known fact is that although the island appears to be completely abandoned, it is not entirely devoid of human touch. Mitsubishi still owns the island and for many years, even after its desertion, employees would make periodic trips to ensure the safety of the structures. Today, the island is partially open to tourists, with guided tours allowing a glimpse into its past. The visitor experience is both surreal and somber, offering a vivid illustration of the impermanence of human endeavor. While a portion of the island has been restored to make it safe for visitors, many parts remain off-limits. Too dilapidated and dangerous, yet they stand as untouched testimonies to a past era. Hashima Island serves as a tangible tale of humanity's ceaseless ambition, a reminder of the often overlooked human cost of rapid industrialization and a living testament to the ephemeral nature of our worldly achievements. It's a concrete parable that floats on the sea, whispering stories that blend triumph and tragedy. It challenges us to look beyond the surface, to question the stories we tell ourselves, and to remember those that history might otherwise forget. Number 5. Fordlandia, Brazil Fordlandia is an often overlooked chapter in the story of American industrialist Henry Ford, Located in the heart of the Brazilian Amazon, it stands as a testament to the grandiosity of American ambition and the intricate complexities that often accompany it. In the 1920s, Ford aimed to establish a utopian society in this remote area for one primary purpose, to harvest rubber. However, what unfolded was a saga of epic failure, replete with cultural misunderstandings, ecological ignorance, and an ultimate concession to the untamable nature of the Amazon. By the early 20th century, Henry Ford's assembly lines were churning out automobiles at unprecedented rates. One key ingredient for these vehicles was rubber, used in tires and various other parts. At the time, British-controlled plantations in Asia dominated the global rubber market. Eager to break free from this monopoly and control his supply chain, Ford set his sights on the Amazon, the original home of the rubber tree. In 1927, Ford acquired a massive 3,900 square mile tract of land in the Brazilian Amazon. The idea was to create an American style town in the middle of the jungle that would serve as both a rubber plantation and a socio cultural experiment. Named Fordlandia, the settlement was intended to be a utopia, featuring American style houses, hospitals, schools, and even a golf course. Almost immediately, Ford's vision ran into problems. He insisted on imposing American ways of life on the local Brazilian workers, including dietary changes like serving food that was unfamiliar and unpalatable to them. This led to worker unrest, culminating in riots. Moreover, Ford's team had little understanding of the Amazon's ecological complexities. Rubber trees, packed closely together in plantations as they were in Asia, became susceptible to diseases and pests in the Amazon, decimating the crops. By the late 1930s, it was clear that Fordlandia was a disastrous failure. Despite investing millions of dollars, not a single pound of rubber harvested from Fordlandia ever made it into a Ford car. During World War II, synthetic rubber was developed, further making natural rubber plantations less essential. 
By 1945, Ford sold the land back to the Brazilian government at a loss, and the dream of Fordlandia was officially over. The town was left to the elements, a peculiar relic of misplaced American idealism and ecological naivety. Today, Fordlandia is a small community that has outlived its original purpose. Some original structures remain, and it serves as a fascinating but obscure tourist destination. The ruins are a haunting reminder of a failed experiment, the vestiges of a clash between industrial ambition and the realities of nature and culture. One of the most intriguing, lesser-known facts about Fordlandia is that Henry Ford himself never actually visited the town he envisioned. He managed the entire project remotely, relying on the expertise of hired engineers and administrators. This detachment could partly explain why the project failed so spectacularly. Make sure to check our video about abandoned railroad towns. Please leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more Ghost Town Chronicles.